Well, the Holy Gospel this fifth Sunday of Lent comes from John chapter 12. Now among those who went up to worship at the festival were some Greeks. They came to Philip, who was from Bethsaida in Galilee, and said to him, Sir, we wish to see Jesus. Philip went and told Andrew. Then Andrew and Philip went and told Jesus. Jesus answered them, The hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. Very truly, I tell you, unless a grain of wheat falls into the earth and dies, it remains a single grain. But if it dies, it bears much fruit. Those who love their life lose it, and those who hate their life in this world will keep it for eternal life. Whoever serves me must follow me, and where I am, there will my servant be also. Whoever serves me, the Father will honor. Now my soul is troubled, and what should I say? Father, save them from this hour? No, it is for this reason that I have come to this hour. Father, glorify your name. Then a voice came from heaven. I have glorified it, and I will glorify it again. The crowd standing there heard it and said that it was thunder. Others said, An angel has spoken to him. Jesus answered, This voice has come for your sake, not for mine. Now is the judgment of this world. Now the ruler of this world will be driven out. And I, when I am lifted up on the earth, will draw all people to myself. He said this to indicate the kind of death he was to die. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. Well, I love those palm branches, and so kids, if you were making them and sending pictures in, I invite you and your families to show up at the community center and bring those palm branches with you because you can wave them in our palm parade next week as we march to church. So on this fifth Sunday in Lent, I would suspect that fear is a feeling all of us have experienced in the last year. Now, we all may respond to the feeling of fear differently, but we usually do one of two things when we feel fear. We either stand our ground and fight, or we take flight. But do you ever think about Jesus being afraid? Or for that matter, do you ever think about Jesus feeling any kind of human feelings like being lonely or sad or angry? I think most often when we think about Jesus, we think about Jesus and his divinity as God. We have this picture of Jesus with an aura of light around him, doing miracles and playing with children. The gospel lesson that you just heard read to you by Pastor Tyler has something that happens before it. And it was not read this morning. And in this part of the gospel, Jesus has just risen Lazarus from the dead after he's been dead for three days. Now you think this would be something to celebrate, right? But Lazarus's resurrection terrified the religious leaders of the time. If word would get out about this resurrection, then more people would gather in crowds to follow Jesus. And as the crowds would grow, they were afraid that the Roman Empire would take notice and be afraid, and then they would destroy the Jewish temple and their nation. In just the briefest sentence in John 11, this is what it says. So from that day on, they planned to put Jesus to death. Jesus, therefore, no longer walked about openly among the Jews, but went to a town called Ephraim in the region near the wilderness and he remained there with the disciples. 
Jesus has to be afraid. He has to be terrified. We know this because John says that he literally goes underground. He goes to a town right outside of the wilderness with his disciples and he remains hidden. Now more than 2,000 years later, we see a Jesus who heals, a Jesus who resurrects, a Jesus who turns water into wine. But we rarely think about a Jesus who goes underground, who is afraid and hides in a town. But if we believe that Jesus is not just fully divine, but also fully human, we have to embrace the full humanity of Jesus. Jesus grew hungry. Jesus was tired. Jesus was frustrated. Jesus was tempted. Jesus could be a pain in the butt. Jesus was homesick. And Jesus could be afraid. In the midst of his hiding, two Greek men approach Philip, and they simply ask Philip, we wish to see Jesus. We wish to see Jesus. Jesus' followers in first century Palestine had the privilege to experience Jesus with all their senses. They could see him, they could touch him, they could feel him, they could hear him, they could even smell the person that Jesus was. He was with the people. This is why the crowds gathered to see Jesus. This is why the crowds gathered to hear Jesus. This is why the two Greek men came to see Jesus. Isn't that what we all want? To see Jesus? I wish to see Jesus too, especially in this last year. I have wanted to see Jesus, but I found myself asking, where is Jesus? Where was Jesus when our aging parents got sick and had to land in a care facility or hospital and we weren't allowed to see them? Where was Jesus when Soon Park and Hyun Grant and Sunsha Kim and five other Asian Americans were gunned down by a man who claimed to be a Christian. Where is Jesus? Sometimes it feels like Jesus is still in hiding outside of that wilderness, doesn't it? When we suffer, when we are in pain, when we feel angry or alone, it feels like Jesus is hiding. But Jesus is very clear in our reading today. His hour has come. His hour has been come to be lifted up for all the world to see in his death on the cross and in his resurrection and eventually in his ascension, that Jesus is with us and for us. His hour has come, and he will not, and he does not, remain in hiding. Jesus is the seed that dies, and that through his death and resurrection, there may be life, an abundance of life. John tells us this earlier in John 3.16 when he says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, that everyone who believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. Sometimes death has to come in order for there to be life. Jesus tells his followers in John 12 that you and I must reject the things of this world that are not life-giving. And instead, we can experience abundant life in Jesus Christ. Where is Jesus? Jesus, again, is clear. Wherever my servant is, There will I also be. And that's you, folks. That's you. 
As followers of Jesus, you are Jesus' servants. Jesus' flesh, Jesus the human being, may no longer physically be with us, but God is still using flesh. God is still using our humanness to show the world that Jesus remains with us and is in us in our suffering and meets us at the foot of the cross. Three days after Christmas, I received a call this year, very early one Sunday morning, from my dad that my mom was not well. Due to COVID, we hadn't seen my parents for several months because both of my parents are in the high-risk category. But right after we received that call, Rick and I jumped into our cars and drove down to my parents' home where I found my mom so ill she couldn't get out of bed. My parents had already called 911 and we waited for the paramedics to arrive. Within minutes, a group of paramedics and the St. Michael Fire and Rescue workers showed up and entered my mom's bedroom. As the group arrived, I realized that one of the people who arrived with them was Tim Slavin. Tim is a member of Word of Peace, and you will see him often being one of our ushers here at Word of Peace. And I told my mom that she was in good hands. Her blood pressure was so low, she wasn't making much sense, but Tim and those gathered in her room were so patient with her as they asked her about her symptoms and her medications, and quickly it was determined that she needed to be taken to the hospital, where she spent over a week there, but I'm happy to say is home and getting better each day. What is and has always amazed me about paramedics and fire and rescue workers is that they freely give of their time. They're on call and they show up to help people. When they get the calls, they have no idea what they're walking into. They don't know how sick a person is or how safe the house will be. And they show up no matter who you are. And they are present with people in their suffering and in their fear. They show up. Tim showed up. And Tim is Jesus' servant. When he showed up in my parents' home that day, Jesus may not have physically been present with my mother, but Jesus was present. And he was present through Tim. God loves things by becoming them. God became flesh because God loves us. God became flesh flesh through Jesus in order that God would understand our suffering and our pain and our joy. And Jesus tells us he's present not just in us but in things too. He's present in all creation And he tells his disciple during his last supper with them that he is present in the bread and the wine and every time they consume it, they can remember that Jesus is present with them. And if we are truly what we eat, when we receive the bread and wine during worship, we remember that Jesus is in us and is present with us. And if we open our eyes, Father Richard Rohr says, we can see Jesus everywhere because we live in a Christ-soaked world. Christ's sacredness is everywhere, in creation, in people, in Holy Communion, in the waters of baptism. Christ is everywhere. Jesus is the seed that produces fruit. It produces joy. When we experience joy, we are in the presence of Christ. You can experience joy even when you're suffering and afraid. 
I was afraid on that Sunday morning what would happen to my mom, but all I had to do was look up and see the presence of God through Tim and all the other people gathered in that room. And I experienced joy. If you had aging parents who needed to be in the hospital or care facility, Jesus showed up in the care of the doctors and nurses. And I pray that the Asian community can see Jesus' presence in us, in the people of Word of Peace, where we stand against and speak out about the evils of racism. What is unique to Christianity is that God becomes flesh. Our God becomes human in order that God may be with us. Theologian Paul Tillich recalls hearing stories during the Nuremberg War Trials during World War II of the horrific genocide. And during this time, he calls hearing a story about a group of people who escaped the Nazi gas chambers and hid in a cemetery in Wilma, Poland. For days, the people spent time living in the cemetery in order to hide from the evils of Nazi Germany. And on one of these days, a woman who was pregnant with the group went into labor. And while she went into labor, she got into an empty grave with an 80-year-old grave digger who assisted her with the birth. And she gave birth to her baby in an open grave. And after the cries of the baby could be heard by the grave digger, he began to pray. And this is what he prayed. Great God, has thou finally sent the Messiah for us? For what else but the Messiah could be born in a grave? We wish to see Jesus. Where is Jesus? Well, Jesus climb down into the grave with you and is res resurrecting you every day just like he resurrected Lazarus. And he continues to resurrect you and I through the flesh, through the humanness and the care and the love of his people. Amen. Let us pray. Dear Lord Jesus, use our flesh, use our humanness to walk into the lives of people who are suffering, who need our care, who need our love, who need us to work for justice. Let us see Christ in every living human being in this world and see that they are your creation and that you love them. In your holy name we pray. Amen.